Well, good evening, everybody. It is time to begin our uh, study for this evening as we continue on in our study in the book of Isaiah. Uh, as we get started this evening, if you will, please uh, join with me in a word of prayer. Our Lord and Father, we are grateful to you for the many ways that you have blessed us today, and we pray that you will be with us as we uh, study from your word and uh, as we try to glean from your servant Isaiah, Father, uh, help us to understand these things that we can uh, better understand uh, not only the message given through Isaiah, but it can help us in our uh, studies of other prophetic books and in uh, our understanding of your word. We ask, Father, that you'll be with those who may not be with us for whatever reason, and uh, Father, that those hindrances might be removed. We ask all of this in your Son's name. Amen. All right, so we are in Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, and we're basically near the end of this little section here, uh, dealing with the, uh, the glory of the servant and his kingdom. Um, it's chapters 55 and 56, and both 55 and 56 are, are relatively short chapters, um, but there's a lot that happens in these chapters, a lot that is uh, said. Uh, so as we begin um, <clears throat> uh, in chapter 55, uh, if I could have a volunteer read verses 1 through 5, please. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come, come to the waters. And you, have, you who have no money, come, buy eat. Come, buy wine and milk without honey and without cost. <clears throat> Why do you spend money... For what does not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you, you do not know, and a nation which knows you, not will knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God even the Holy One of Israel for He has glorified you. Thank you. All right. So, what's God trying to say through Isaiah in these verses? <clears throat> Here we are, fifty-five chapters deep into Isaiah. So let's let's stretch our brain muscles a little bit and and. Uh, Kind of work through this together. Well, verse 3 says, Incline near and come unto me. So, is that what he's saying? Okay. Basically, the whole idea. Yeah, he's calling the people to come to him. Uh, what's significant about this call? What is he, what's he promising? If they listen to his call. Okay, an everlasting covenant. It's a call to change, right? Remember, we're talking about the servant in his kingdom. That's what these chapters are about. And so God is, is calling them to this new kingdom. Now, what about this, all this stuff about not having money and not buying bread and all of this? What is, what is that getting at? That's a monetary. Okay. Yeah. Just believe. And just like what Jesus was saying. Yeah. Okay. Anything to introduce that we can use. There's there's an aspect where he's saying that there's not going to be a cost uh, necessarily just to hear the word, but there's also the idea when he says, "Do not spend money for what is not bread." It's about focus, right? Where should their focus be? Yeah. On God. Okay. Now, it's not to say that it's wrong to have to want food, right? That's not what God's saying. But you know, the the idea here is that He's going to provide, right? Come and get wine and milk without money, without cost, right? God's going to provide so that then you can focus on what you need to focus on. He's calling them to this new kingdom. He's calling them to this everlasting covenant. 
and it's going to be different, right? It's going to be an everlasting covenant similar to that which he promised to David. According to the mercies, it's going to have those ideas in mind, but it's going to be different, right? Because they're going to be calling people from foreign nations, and people from foreign nations are going to be running to them because of the, whole, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. All right, so it's important that we understand the setting of this as we get into this next section. And a verse here in chapter 55 that is often misapplied. All right. So let's look at verses. Uh, let's go. Let's go six through nine for now. If I could have a volunteer read that. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. The wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. All right, thank you. All right, so remember, this is God focusing on, trying to focus them on the spiritual and calling them to this new kingdom in chapter 55 here. So what is he trying to, stri trying to strike at here when he makes this second call in verse 6? Okay, keep God in the forefront. But what is he? What's what's the call in verse six? Okay, seek the Lord. Don't believe her. Okay, so f look to God while He can be found. What's the what's the reason they should be seeking God according to verse seven? Because He offers forgiveness. Okay, so remember. He's going to bring this new kingdom. He's going to bring this new, uh, this new nation, if you will. And he, he says, seek after me while I can be found. Seek God through whom salvation comes. And then, so what is verses 8 and 9 referring to then? Okay, God's thoughts, the people need to change their ways to God's thoughts. That's part of it. Okay, not spiritual thing, you're not physical things, but spiritual things. We're, we're kind of on. Okay, you want to explain that a little more? Okay, uh, he, he, I, he's saying that it's better to turn to him for more than just forgiveness. I'll agree with that. Does Israel or anybody else deserve forgiveness? Okay, we, we can't forget our context here. Verse 7, he just got done saying, I offer forgiveness, right? And then he says in verse 8, my thoughts are greater than your thoughts. My ways are better than your ways. So what's he talking about? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet enemies of God, he gave himself for us. It's going to all be part of this new covenant. It's going to be part of calling these, these kingdoms, these, these foreign lands, because God thinks bigger than man does. We get hung up when people wrong us on the wrong and on the person, and God says we've got to do better. We have to be like him. But so we're, you know, like I said, those were all right, but it's specific here to 
our approach to people and our approach to sin. Sin is wrong, but forgiveness can be found, right? And so God is, is urging us to see that, well, what's the, sto- what's the real story of the prodigal son? We often focus on the prodigal, but what's the real message? It's the other brother. That's where the lesson actually lies. What was what was the major pro, one of the major problems and it's addressed in almost every single book in our New Testament in regards to the to the church and its members. Problems with one another. The Jews versus the Gentiles, right? Because who's more worthy of forgiveness? The Jew or the Gentile? Ah, but see, people don't always think that way. Or who's, who's better? The, the Jews who were already very close to God and yes, still needed forgiveness or... Is it the Gentiles who were so far from God and were forgiven? But see, people posture in those ways as well. And we see that, by the way, in the early church. That's why Paul has to write chapters like Romans chapter 6, where he says, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Because people had this mistaken idea of what constituted glorifying God. Yes, we glorify in God's ability and willingness to forgive all sin, but that doesn't mean that Whoever had the highest score before they sought forgiveness wins. Right? The disciples even struggled with that too before uh, Jesus' betrayal. Yeah. They were arguing with the greatest. Possibly the greatest way that you and I struggle to think like God is in, re- is in the realm of forgiveness. And that's what God's really driving at here in this passage. Is that he has a bigger view of things than we do. And especially in regards to forgiveness. What happened to Paul when he was first uh, converted and he tried to go back to Jerusalem? Yeah, they all, they wanted to run him out of town on a rail. Right? Because they didn't believe that a person could change. Our habits haven't changed that much in 2,000 years, right? One of those things. And so this is what we then... We springboard off of this, this understanding that God's ways, especially in regards to his plan for salvation. Remember, salvation is going to come through the Jews, but it's not going to be for the Jews exclusively, right? Which is kind of what they, kind of what they expected to a certain extent. If I could have a volunteer read verses 10 through 13, please. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, the water the earth and make it spring forth and bud, may, may, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For he shall go out with joy. And be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field that clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the, the cypress tree, and instead of the, the briar 
shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be in the Lord for a name, for its everlasting sign it shall not be cut off. Thank you. So God's word is going to go out and it's not going to come back empty or void. What's he talking about? Jesus. Okay, Jesus. But what specific purpose of Jesus' ministry and life and kingdom? Spread God's word. Okay, to spread God's word, but to save souls. To save souls. Forgiveness. We haven't we haven't changed subject. He's still on the same one. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. The word's going to go out into the world, and it's going to it's going to bear fruit, right? And it has borne fruit, right, for now literally thousands of years. And there's going to be a transformation in this kingdom. That's what he's getting at in verses twelve and thirteen. When he talks about peace and, and the joy and all of these things, the world is going to rejoice, but there's going to be a measure of peace as we go out into the world. Not necessarily physical peace, right? I mean, we talked about Paul getting rejected in, in Jerusalem at first, but then when he goes out into the Gentile world, were they exactly holding open arms for him? But there's a peace that when we go out, right, into even dangerous places, God is with us, right? And that's this, this difference that he, he speaks of in verse 13, of course, being very poetic here. The, the difference between a cypress tree and thorn bushes or nettles and myrtle trees. What was once... you know, brush to be cleared away and is now going to be you know, fertile. A transformation of individuals. And this is what this is what the kingdom of the servant is going to offer. An opportunity for change. Because did the Jewish people need to change in order to accept Jesus? Yeah? Did the Gentiles need to change in order to accept Jesus? Yep. Everybody has to change to accept Jesus because if we didn't have to change, Jesus wouldn't have had to die, right? That's what repentance is, right? It's an acknowledgement that I've done wrong, but I don't want to be that person anymore. So I'm going to try not to do X, Y, and Z anymore. And so God gives us this opportunity to be something beautiful. All right, so let's now move on to chapter 56. <clears throat> if I get a volunteer, read verses 1 through 5, please. Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness. My salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who, keep, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing the evil. Let the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Thank you. So we, we continue with the same vein of thought even though in our Bibles there is a chapter break. And God now says, preserve justice and do righteousness, right? Why? Because salvation is coming. So right there, he's making sure we understand where we're still at, right? In order to obtain and maintain salvation, 
Well, we have to preserve justice and do righteousness, right? And so we see this statement in verse 2, how blessed is the man who does this. This is a very formulaic statement. It's used by God a lot in the Bible. Okay, It's used in the Psalms a lot. It's used in the prophets a lot. How blessed is the man, or blessed be. All right? And it is can easily be translated as happy is the man. It, the, the word here for blessed and happy shares the same root in Hebrew. And that's important for us to understand, especially when we get to a very particular passage in the book of Matthew. Anybody have any ideas what passage I'm talking about? Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Jesus, again, coming from a distinctly Jewish background, right, is using this same formulaic statement. If you want to be blessed, if you want to be a happy individual, this is how you live your life. Here, Isaiah, or God through Isaiah, says to be happy in life, to be blessed, is to take hold of the word of God. And, he, and then he points to two groups of people... <laughs> That would not be the first choice of most Jewish people. What are those two groups? Gentiles and eunuchs. Gentiles, well, obviously, they're not Jewish, right? That's really all the term Gentile means, is not Jewish. So, they can't be accepted of God, right? They can't be given this opportunity. Uh-oh. Except for they can. Now, what about eunuchs? Without getting too graphic into what a eunuch is, but why would, why would that be a troublesome group? They are... They are Physically, I like the way you put that. They are physically incomplete. And people who were physically incomplete could not participate in certain aspects of Jewish worship. For example, you could not serve as a priest even if you were the most ironic of Aaron's family if you had any sort of physical deformity. Those who had physical problems, whether they were of, of birth or of later uh, development or something even done either to someone or to themselves in this kind of way that would make them unwhole, didn't necessarily make them unholy, but it did make them unclean, essentially, in a lot of aspects. Yeah, to a large degree. I mean, our, our, our modern societies have come a long way in accepting people who have different abilities, right? And even that's the term that we, to, we tend to use is differently abled, right? Or disabled, you know, we, we kind of, it's becoming less popular to use the term disabled, but... Um, you know, we've made a lot of accommodations and we've... we've in the vernacular, I could uh, hear the other day in the movie that uh, she was a uh, triple check. I mean, you get the visibility checks. Yeah. And yet, are those people really 100% accepted in society? No.
exactly. Yeah, God never said that they were that that those those who were physically, you know, uh, disabled or you know what have you. He never he never said that they were to be ostracized or uh, made to feel like less of a, an individual. But remember, Israel was also an agrarian society, right? And, and this is one of the things that we still fight against in our modern society, even though we are no longer really defined as agrarian. When somebody can't go out into a field and do as much work as other people, they're not valued the same way by a lot of people, right? Well, we have the same problem in our modern society. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Frank? Frank? Oh, absolutely. We're we're almost to the point in the book of John where John where Jesus interacts with a bl man who was born blind, and the first question Jesus is asked is, "Who sinned, this man or his parents?" There was this mistaken idea because God did not accept, like I said, service, for example, from Levites who didn't meet a certain that somehow those pers those people's disabilities or whatever, was somehow associated with sin. And God never makes that connection in the Bible, ever, right? And yet some of those things still persist. And, and there is this idea that even in our modern society, that if, unless somebody is somehow productive by some sort of <laughs> made-up metric most of the time, right, that they're not valuable, by the way. It's that, and I say that we still have this major problem, even with our willingness to accommodate for pe people maybe born deaf or born blind or what have you. Even to some extent, people born with autism or other uh, mental uh, disabilities or what have you, ex but only when we allow them to be born. Right? Just a few years ago, there was an article talking about, I want to say that it was Iceland, had claimed that they had eliminated Down syndrome from their population. You know how they did it? By aborting every single baby who tested positive for Down syndrome. That is a distinct and direct result of the devaluation of people because they are not deemed productive. Do you know what the other side of that coin is? Euthanasia. The fact that as a society we tend to take our elderly and hold them away or just flat out kill them because they are no longer deemed productive or valuable. Euthanasia is not just for the elderly, it's also heavily imposed, impressed, pushed, encouraged upon those with physical disabilities as well. Societies who truly value every individual don't push either of those options on anyone. And that's why, again, this new era, this new time, this new welcoming was supposed to be so different. And... and the reason I wanted to mention this is because I want I want us to appreciate how 
how much verses 8 and 9 are true of chapter 55. Because God actually does look at every single person and see their value. And see that they are precious. Right? And he offers this hope of forgiveness and salvation. He offers an opportunity to change, to be something better. He offers an opportunity for those people to come and to serve him in his temple when previously they may have been restricted. And that is earth shattering. That is absolutely 180 degrees different from almost every society that humanity has ever known, including Jewish society. And that's one of the reasons that Jesus and his covenant, Jesus and his message, Jesus and his church are so divisive is because it's supposed to be so different from what people have ever seen or experienced before. Remember, Jesus is the person, is a man who did not shy away from foreigners. He did not shy away from those with these disabilities. He reached out and touched a leper. That's different. All right, let's continue on, verse, uh, picking up here in verse 6 of chapter 56. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and who holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples." The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. What a beautiful picture, right? And again, we see echoes of this in Jesus' own statements, right? When he says, there are others afar off that I must go to, right? Not meaning Jesus himself physically, but the message of Jesus would need to go out into the world, right? I think this is some of the the power of these prophecies, especially when you look at, you know, similar things said by Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel and and of course the minor, you know, various minor prophets as well about this unexclusive exclusivity. Right? Christianity is still very exclusive, right? It's only for those who are willing to make themselves the servants of God, right? Those who are willing to join and minister and and serve and hold fast his covenant, right? That's what verse 6 says. So they're they're, they're still very exclusive, but it doesn't matter who you are if you're willing to do those things, right? doesn't matter where you came from, what your background is, who your parents were. What your zip code is, right? If we come to God, he will accept us. He will add us to those already gathered. That's beautiful. And as much as humans have tried and are still trying to parody at best these ideas, the only place that it's even really ever happened, and it 
you know, we still have problems is in the church. It's not in any government. It's not in any club or social circle or it's in the church because that's where God promised it would work. Because sadly, many of those barriers are only going to come down when people are willing to tear them down. And it works because when we all want to give ourselves to the Lord and minister and serve and hold fast, I care more about those things than anything else about you, right? Whether you're tall or short or skinny or not skinny. As white as the driven snow or as dark as night, it doesn't matter, right? Only one place I've ever even seen an act, even an honest attempt at that is in the church. That's the power of the word that will not go out empty, right? All right, let's go ahead and finish the chapter. If I could have a volunteer read verses 9 through 12. All you beasts of the field, come to devour. All you beasts of the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping or lying down and loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough, and they are shepherds who cannot understand that they look to their own ways. Every one of his own grain, his own gain from his own territory. Come, one says, I will bring wine, and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. Contrast. And again, I see echoes here of Jesus, right? Because he wasn't afraid to use some strong language at times, not foul language, strong language. What does he call these, these people who reject all of the things that we just talked about in verses 6 through 8. Dumb dogs, beasts of the field, greedy dogs, lazy, know-nothings. Whoa. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, right? Right? He's singling out those who, and I don't mean, let me see how I want to say this. He's singling out those like the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Those who would try to use the idea of pomp and self-importance, position, to make themselves appear far more righteous than they really were, while at the same time denying the ideas of service and humility and all of those things. Um, this idea of the shepherds who have gone astray, that's again one of those um, one of those pictures that is painted broadly by the prophets and by the psalmists and by Jesus himself, right? He even quotes um, from those passages um, in talking about, well, men like the Pharisees and, and the other leaders. And, and I say it's men like the Pharisees because we often single out the Pharisees, but even shortly after Jesus' death in the beginning of the church, Peter and John were 
persecuted and attacked by men who were Sadducees also. So it wasn't, it wasn't about any particular name or group. It's about the mentality. It is about the way that they do, that these are, you know, and again, he, he points out that they, they make, you know, they are shepherds that have no understanding. People are following them, right? That's the point of a shepherd, right? Is to be watching over others. But what are, the, what are these shepherds concerned with? Only with themselves. Only with the gain that they get from having other people under them, essentially, right? And then it's, we see, you know, we see echoes in verse 10 and in verse 12 of each other, talking about these dreamers laying down, wanting to slumber, and then they're depicted as drunkards wanting to do nothing but drink and, and pretend that everything is great, right? And I mean, and I, and I want to make sure that we understand that this isn't even just entirely about religious leadership. This is about really any leaders because... What's the saying about Nero while Rome was burning? What was he doing? Playing his fiddle. Playing his fiddle. He couldn't be bothered, right? His kingdom's fall. You know the idea, the picture that that should that it paints in your mind is the king should care, and he just doesn't. His kingdom is literally burning to the ground behind him. He only cares about himself. But it's especially heinous in the construct or in the, the realm of religion, and that's why Jesus takes it, takes it head on with such force. But people are people, and these types of people are not just drawn to religious circles. But this is the difference. We have a, we have a, we live in a world, we live in a society that is increasingly and detrimentally self-obsessed, right? We make a lot of jokes and a lot of quips about things like participation trophies and, you know, things of that nature, but it began when I was a kid. And emphasizing self-esteem and, and things of this nature, but not really teaching anything about self-worth. And that's what builds self-esteem, by the way, is when you realize that you have value despite your flaws. Or, in certain instances, the fact that your flaws give you greater value. You see, going back to our earlier conversations, is somebody who is disabled going to approach a problem the same as somebody who is generally healthy when it comes to crossing over something or getting through something or, you know, some sort of physical task. They can't approach it the same way, right? But see, that leads to changing things, right? Finding new ways to do things that benefit everybody involved. From the mental aspect, it's pretty much, at this point, assumed that men like Einstein and others probably had a touch of autism but it's a lot what allowed them to clear their minds the way that they did and focus so singularly on some of those problems. And I mean, just think about that. You 
Just think about what happens to societies when we rob ourselves of anybody who's different or thinks differently or looks differently or, right? And that's the point. <laughs> Is that all of those people who come to God, all of those people, who those foreigners and, and those who come, do we bring baggage? Most definitely. But we also bring solutions, right? We all walk down different paths. Yeah. I can't even count how many times I've been stuck on something in my personal or professional life and I'm just can't figure out how to get it done and somebody else walks up and and you're just standing there going I've been staring at that for an hour and probably still be staring at it if everybody thought the way that I did right if everybody approached problems the way I did it'd still be stuck wherever it was And again, that goes back to the way of thinking that God sees things, the way that God sees things is that it's the differences that strengthen us. This is, there's reasons why this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture, by the way. It's, it's beautiful. I love talking about these things. And we're going to transition here next week, Lord willing, into the last section of the book of Isaiah, chapters 57 through the end of the book, um, where God is going to, he's going to still be talking about the difference in the kingdom, but it's not quite as of a positive note, just to kind of warn you, I guess. Uh, he's going to talk, continuing to talk about salvation and hope, but also about judgment and and wickedness. So, uh, Lord willing, we will pick up there in chapter 57 next week. Thank you. Our first song this evening will be number 297. Number 297. I want to be a worker. Number 297. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker every day. I want to lead the erring in the way that heaven above where all is peace and love in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker strong and brave. I 
want to trust in Jesus' power to save. All who will truly come shall find a happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work, I will pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the If you will please mark number 674, number 674, that will be the song after the lesson this evening. Good to see all of you here tonight. The fear of rejection is one of the most basic fears of the human experience. And Mr. Webster I found four th items that he brings up as to being having being having rejection. The first one he says to refuse to take or to agree to take something, to discard or throw out as worthless or useless, to pass over or skip from, and the last one is to rebuff to deny acceptance, to, to deny care or love, especially to someone. I have a heartwarming story I'd like to, to read about some of this. One man told a heartwarming story of a man who finally decided to ask his boss for a raise in salary. It was Friday. He told his wife that morning he was about to, what he was about to do. All day, the man felt nervous and apprehensive. Late in the afternoon, he summoned the courage to approach his employer. To his delight, the boss agreed to a raise. The man arrived home to a beautiful table set with their best china. Candles were lit. His wife had prepared a, fe a festive meal and immediately he figured that someone from the office had tipped her off. Finding his wife in the kitchen, he told her the good news. They embraced, they kissed, they sat down to a wonderful meal. Next to his plate, the man found a beautiful letter. It was a note, it read, congratulations, darling. I knew you'd get the raise. These things will tell you how much I love you. After dinner, he went to get some dessert. While he was on his way to the kitchen, he noticed that a second card had fallen from his wife's pocket. He picked it off the floor and it read, don't worry about not getting the raise, you deserved it. Anyway, these, these things will tell you how much I love you. Total acceptance, total love, her love for him was not contagious upon 
his success at work. In fact, just the opposite. If he, if he were to fail there, if he were to be rejected by his boss, he'd be all the more accepted at home. She stood behind him no matter what, softening the blows, healing the wounds, believing in him, loving him. We can bear rejection from almost anyone if we're loved by one. That's the way families can be with each other. And I'd like to think that's the way God is with us too. We love him because he first loved us. I'd like to follow that up with uh, some words from 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 11 through 19. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we want love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us. We may be boldness in the days of in the day of judgment because he is so are we in this world when he is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect we love him because he first loved us and again we love him because he first loved us. I hope you can cast out fear of rejection and put your love in God. If there's anyone here tonight who has a need for prayers or help of any kind, please respond as we sing the invitation song, song that we have been, that has been selected. Would you stand please? There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are judgment day. Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming. There's a bright day coming by and by. But it's brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are sad day coming, a sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his doom, dear, 
depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Please be seated. Evening, everyone. Just a few announcements before we're dismissed in prayer. Coming up uh, this Saturday, we have a craft day for the YBC, scheduled for between 9 and 12, and snacks are provided. Uh, let's remember that Sunday we have uh, Bible classes at 9.30, morning worship at 10.30, evening worship at 7. Uh, we have a men's business meeting, Oct uh, I don't know why I said October, April 12th. Um, it's at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall uh, baby shower for Leah on the 23rd and we have our birthday fellowship on the 24th its theme is comfort food and the hosts are Garrett and Linda Sander and our uh, Bible Bowl is scheduled for April 27th um, Gary Curtis had made a sent us a text earlier this afternoon saying that he wasn't feeling well that's the reason why he's not here tonight uh, is there anything else, Garrett? Uh, update on uh, my cousin Gavin. Uh, surgery went very well. He's actually already up and walking and was supposed to be released from the hospital tonight. Very good. Uh, if you didn't hear, uh, Garrett's cousin Gavin had his surgery today. He's up and well and doing, doing well from that. So good to hear from that. Is there anything else? Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, Father in heaven, we're so thankful, Lord, for yet another beautiful day you've blessed us with, this beautiful weather that you've given to us. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless us with these beautiful weather and we pray that we can possibly get some rain here in the near future. We're so thankful, Lord, for this time of worship. We're so thankful for the time that we'll be able to come to songs, to sing songs of praise to you, to study more from your word. We pray, Lord, that as we continue our study with Isaiah, that we can apply what we are hearing and what we're learning to our lives. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with those who are on a prayer list, that you'll keep your healing hand upon them, and that you will guide the, those who are administering to them the kind of surgeries that might be happening or the caretakers that uh, might be helping them. We pray that you'll be with each and every one of them. We're so thankful for your son and his and your your love for us and his sacrifice upon the cross and his shed blood that would give us forgiveness of sins. Please be with us now and the rest of this, this evening and the rest of this week until the next time that we meet. In Christ we pray. Amen.